Hi, this is Chris Overholt, and uh, in this module I'd like to talk about fire plumes and flame heights. And in here we'll look at uh, different uh, flame height predictions. We'll define the fire plume, also talk about the concept of a ceiling jet, and do some example calculations, and also comparisons to the fire model FDS. So to begin, we start with the definition of a fire plume, and a fire plume consists of three basic regions uh, near the bottom where the fuel is burning. In this case, it could be a liquid pool fire of diesel or kerosene or something. And near the bottom of the pan, we have the continuous flame region, which is where, um, as the name suggests, the flame is continuous in this area. Above that, we have an intermittent flame region. And here, flame may or may not exist due to pulsing um, and entrainment. So here we may see um, flickering or pulsing where there's not always flame. Above that region is the buoyant plume region. And in here, the physical flame does not exist, but we're still within the fire plume because hot gases are rising due to buoyancy um, in this region. And this can be important for sprink sprinkler and smoke detector activations, and we'll look at that uh, in a few slides. So with those basic definitions, we can also look at the idealized fire plume, uh, where the plume itself can be viewed as an inverted cone, where at the bottom here we have a point source fire at the floor, and as we travel upwards the cone expands, and we also have, you'll notice that the text, uh, the equations in the textbook all refer to uh, center line temperatures, maximum center line temperatures, maximum velocities, and all of the um, different properties can be related to the center line temperature and velocity profile. So with that, uh, we ask the question if the flame height, the physical flame height, which is denoted as L, can we relate that to the heat release rate Q or other independent parameters? And so shown here in this diagram, is some fire at the floor level with some physical flame height L and we see that inverted cone profile going upwards to the ceiling and we see this entire region up here defined as the plume region. Also we'll notice QC which is the convective heat release rate denoted here whereas Q is denoted here for the total heat release rate and we'll see why that's important uh, in a second. One other thing to note in this diagram is that the virtual origin or the point source is, is located below the floor and this is because if we have a finite burning area at the floor surface the virtual origin of the inverted cone will actually exist below the floor um, and the cone expands upwards to match that burning area. So with that we're going to look to see if we can relate the flame height to Q or some other independent parameters. And in fact, this equation from the textbook shows just that. It shows the L, the physical flame height, as a function of Q, the total heat release rate, and D, the diameter of the fire. And notice the units on this. Uh, Q is in kilowatts, and D is, in, is the diameter of the fire in meters, or the equivalent diameter in meters. Um, this equation was formed from a set of experiments that were run, uh, pool fire experiments, and a power law fit, as you can see here, a power law fit was used uh, to relate Q and D to the physical flame height L. So we'll use this equation in an example. Uh, before we do that, uh, I'd like to make the distinction between the total energy release rate, Q dot, should be used when calculating the mean flame height which we'll do in an example, and the position of the virtual origin. Otherwise, when we estimate other plume properties, we'll use QC, which is the convective heat release rate. And typically for, uh, for most fires and, and for this course, we'll, we will assume that the convective energy release rate is 70% uh, of the total heat release rate. And this is true for liquid pool fires and uh, most cases. So with that, let's consider an example where we have a 500 kilowatt diesel pool fire with a diameter of 1.5 meters, and that's shown here. 
So if we have Q of 500 and a diameter of 1.5, if we plug those into the above equation, and notice the units are consistent, 500 kilowatts, 1.5 meters, we get out a physical flame height, L, of 1.3 meters from this equation. So 1.3 meters, about a 4 foot flame height. So from that, uh, now that we have that solution, we, we can then ask how does this empirical answer compare to, say, a simulation from Fire Dynamic Simulator, or FDS? Is FDS able to predict uh, the correct flame height? And how do those answers compare to our empirical answer? So with that, I, I created an FDS simulation, which I'll show here. And first, I'll show the flame itself. So here's the flame. Also, you'll see tick marks on the side, which show the height in meters. Uh, so with this flame, I've created a 500 kilowatt fire with an equivalent burning area of 1.2 meters squared, which is the burning area of a 1.5 meter diameter uh, circular pool. So with that, if we look, we can see uh, the different regions. First, we see the continuous flame region near the base. Then here we see the intermittent flame region where the flame is sort of pulsing up and down and there's not always flame. And also above here if I turn on the, the temperature of the slice, sorry a slice file of the temperatures, we can see hot gases exist above the physical flame height on the order of 400 to 500 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's defined as the plume region. So from the simulation uh, we can see that the flame height predicted is about 1 to 1.2 meters. And how well does that compare to our empirical answer of 1.3 meters? Well, it turns out that it's pretty good. It's pretty close, 1.3 meters, 1.2 meters. Um, in this case, FDS can certainly be used to demonstrate fire dynamics because it's actually solving the combustion, heat transfer, and the flow field directly, whereas our empirical equation is using previous data sets to estimate um, what the flame height would be. Um, additionally, FDS is not held back or limited uh, like the empirical equation. The empirical equation would break down at larger flame heights. Any flame height that would be outside of that experimental data set, the relationship would begin to break down, whereas in FDS we could always make a larger heat release rate or larger burning area, and because it's solving for the combustion and physics, directly, uh, we'd be able to use it for a wider range of problems. Now, moving on from that, we remember that in the fire plume is not just limited to the physical flame, but that due to buoyancy, the hot gas is uh, traveling upwards, and we collectively refer to these three regions as the fire plume. So what happens if we introduce a ceiling as in an enclosure? Well, the hot gases traveling upward due to buoyancy can no longer travel upwards, so it creates this horizontal ceiling jet that travels in all directions. So we have a velocity profile, a temperature profile, all in the ceiling jet, and outside of this area is assumed to be ambient conditions. So there are some equations from the textbook that can be used to predict the temperatures at the ceiling either near in the near field of the fire or some radial distance r from the fire. So these two equations are given for different conditions. In this case, the ratio of r over h is less than 0 0.18. We use this equation. In the case where r over h is greater than 0.18, we use this equation. So depending on if we're near or far from the fire, these different uh, empirical equations apply. So let's use that in an example. And here we're asked to calculate the expected gas temperature for a sprinkler that's located five meters radially away from the fire in a room with a ceiling height of three meters. So because R over H equals five over three, that ratio is 1.67. We should use the equation where R over H is greater than 0.18. And that's, a, that's this equation here. So if we plug in the values to that equation, you can use a spreadsheet for this. Um, also, in order to calculate the temperatures, we need to know the fire size and the ambient temperature. So I've given those as 1.2 megawatts or 1,200 kilowatts, 
and an ambient temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So if we plug in 1200 kilowatts, 5 meters radially R, and H equal to 3, we also bring the T infinity to the other side and add it in. We get a temperature, maximum temperature at that point of 89 degrees Celsius. So this shows an example of uh, that could be used for in conjunction with sprinkler or smoke detector activation equations which could estimate the required fire size and the time to activation. Now if we know a point in space and we're interested in and we know the temperature to activate a smoke detector, heat detector, or sprinkler, we can actually back out the cue that's required to, cre to cause that temperature at that point. So it's useful for design fire calculations. Also, with some other equations that we'll see later in the semester, we can actually determine the time for the smoke detector or sprinkler to activate. So using these concepts, we've gone over the fire plume definition, we looked at some examples of flame height and ceiling jet temperature calculations, and importantly, we've also compared to fire modeling to FDS. Um, we've compared the empirical and FDS equations and seen that uh, FDS does a, a good job because it's solving for all of these physics directly. And so we'll use these concepts to move on and build our tool sets of uh, fire dynamics.